Welcome back for episode four of The Unqualified Engineer. My name is Jackson Gabbard, and I'm going to Sherpa you through another coding interview problem this time around. So today's problem is called permutation generator. And the premise of this problem is that you're going to write a function that will return a generator. And if you're a Python coder, a generator will be a very familiar concept. People who write in other languages, this is not so familiar. If you're like a JavaScript coder, this is a bit like currying um, or like sort of private state from a function that you can call over and over again that will each time return a different value. Some generators are infinite. You can just keep calling them forever. But in this case, our generator has a very specific number of returns. It can only return n factorial values. And the reason it's n factorial is because that, that, that's the math behind permutations. Now I know what you're thinking, who the fuck is ever going to use this for anything? <laughs> I can't really argue with you there. I also feel like who the fuck is ever going to use this for anything? I, uh, I can say that I talked to one of my friends who's a very strong coder and also a big fan of coding competitions like the ACM or Top Coder. And he was very excited about this problem, specifically because he has had to do this many times and he was able to recite the algorithm from memory. So, for what it's worth, there are competent coders who think of this as a useful and interesting problem. Here's the setup. The challenge is to create a generator function that will take an integer n, and this generator, when called, will return a new permutation of the numbers between 1 and n until all of the permutations have been exhausted. So for instance, if the input was 4, if the integer n was 4, then our generator would start by returning 1, 2, 3, 4, and then on the next call it would be 1, 2, 4, 3, and then 1, 3, 2, 4, and so on until we've exhausted all of the possible permutations. And today we're going to code in C++. That's right, everyone's favorite weird language. Now it's worth pointing out that I'm not actually a real C++ coder. You know what they say? You can teach an old dog new tricks. Or no, that's not what they say, what do they say? That you can't teach a JavaScripter to write code? No, what is it? Anyway, I've been learning C++. And I'm really excited to attempt this video in C++. Generally, I would say don't ever code in a coding interview in a language that you don't know exceptionally well. But in this case, I had time to research and make sure that the code is correct and have it reviewed by some of my competent C++ coder friends. And so I feel confident that I'm putting forth code here that would not get you fired or lose you a job if you were to emulate it. And because it's C++, I'm happy to say that we're going to code with Hungarian notation today. Just kidding, we don't hate ourselves. Now let's talk about this problem in concrete terms. We've already talked about the fact that you would start with something like one, two, three, four. You could generate these permutations in any order. There's no requirement of this problem to keep it in one order or another. Now, if you take the problem the way it's drawn out here, you might immediately notice that these numbers are basically in numerical order, but given that they're not actually integers on their own, they're sets of integers. Maybe I should have put commas between them. So with the commas included, it's actually a little bit clearer that they're not so much in numerical order as they are in lexicographic order. And if you think about it this way, it could actually be anything that can be ordered in a deterministic way instead of numbers. Like we're using numbers here, but it could be anything. These could be letters from the alphabet. They could be your friends in the order in which you like them. They could be political parties sorted by average IQ. And so really the problem here becomes not so much generating permutations, but actually figuring out how to increment a vector of objects lexicographically. Because if you enumerate all of the possible lexicographic orderings of the vector, you will therefore also enumerate all of the possible permutations, because they are one and the same. Let's look at a more complex example. Take, for instance, a permutation of the integers between 1 and 5. How about 3, 5, 4, 2, 1. Now if you stare at this long enough, you would eventually arrive, assuming you follow an algorithm like what we're going to design here, you would arrive at the notion that it is 4, 1, 2, 3, 5. And the important question here is, why? Or rather, how? It's easy enough for anyone who's ever learned to count to say why, it's like because when you count up past this, the next number you can find that has all of the digits in it is 4, 1, 2, 3, 5. But we're not just doing counting here. We're actually implementing lexicographic incrementation. When I think about these kinds of problems or any type of puzzly question, which I absolutely consider this to be, which is part of why I think it's a shitty question to ask in an interview, the thing I look for is what I would call like a grip, a piece of the puzzle, a detail of the problem that lets you sort of 
claw your way, crawl through the muck and the mire of the problem until you understand how to actually solve it. And in this case, one of those grips is that the number is in reverse sorted order up until there is a decrement, up until the numbers go down. So if you, if you start at the right side, you'll notice it's one followed by two, which is bigger, followed by four, which is bigger, followed by five, which is bigger, and then a three. That's a super, super key piece of this problem because no matter which version of this problem you're trying to solve, anytime you go down, that's where the incrementation happens. That's the, the place in the vector where the opportunity to increment comes from. And you can know this because you'll notice before that number, all of those numbers are the biggest possible numbers they can have. You're putting the biggest numbers in the highest order places in the vector, which means you can't possibly increment from there. So you have to have a place where it descends in order to be able to increment. So if we assume at that decrement, at that point where the numbers go down, that that's where we're going to start our process of creating the next permutation or the next lexicographic incrementation, then the question becomes, okay, so what do I do? Like what actually happens here? And if you look at the after case, if you look at the place that we're going to get to, one thing you should notice is that there has been a reversal. Specifically, it's all the numbers after the place that we care about, they're all now in sorted ascending order. Another way to say that is to say that the biggest numbers are in the lowest order positions in the vector. Knowing these things, we've got major parts of the problem within reach. One, we need to find the place in the vector where the value goes down, where we go from a higher value to a lower value, and we need to reverse sort the rest of the vector after that point. But we're clearly missing a detail here, because if we just apply what we've talked about, what we would end up with would be three, one, two, four, five. And that's obviously not what we have in the second case. We have four, one, two, three, five, but those two numbers are only off from each other by one digit. There's one misplaced digit in the three, one, two, four, five case from the four, one, two, three, five case. And that is that the three and the four are misplaced. And that's the third grip of this problem. That's the third tricky thing to notice, that in order to implement lexicographic incrementation, when you find the decrease, the next thing you have to find is, what's the next biggest number that should go in that spot? So you find that number, which in this case is four, and then you swap those numbers. You replace the four with the three and the three with the four. So then what you have would be four, five, three, two, one. And you'll notice at that point that you've got a four and then you've got a reverse sorted suffix, you could call it. Then you've got a reverse sorted tail and so from there, it's really easy to just swap the start of the tail with the end of the tail and the next one after that with the next to last and the next one after that, the next one, however, however many you have to reverse the tail of the list. And what you end up with is exactly what we want here. The exciting part is this works for every case. It works whether the decrease is at the very end or at the very beginning, or if there are many decreases in the same vector, you start at the rightmost one. And that will make sure you're always modifying the lowest order positions in the vector first. Uh, and then you get to the higher order ones later, and that's how lexicographic incrementation works. Okay, 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 enough with this understanding the problem nonsense. Let's get to writing the code. So we're gonna code in C++, and we said that we're going to do this as a generator. Now I'm basically an expert in C++, and when I think of something you can call over and over again, and each time get a different value, I think of functors. Now I have very limited whiteboard space here, so I'm going to break this problem into two parts. One part is going to be setting up the structure of the functor, and the second part is going to be implementing the logic to generate the permutations. So let's talk about the functor first. And I can already tell I'm going to get grief from some snobby C++ programmer who says I'm wasting my time with things like vowels and uppercase. To you, friend, who wants this to be permutation underscore generator, fuck you. I bet your favorite variable name is A, and I bet everyone hates reading your code. So I'm going to call my abstraction permutation generator. So what's this thing going to do? Well, we know it's going to take an n, it's going to take some size, and it's going to create a vector of all of the numbers between one and that number. So let's give ourselves an affordance for those things. C++ functors effectively have a constructor that stores some initial state, and then they implement the function execution operator to do something with that state. They're used a lot in algorithmic programming, especially. 
Of course, there are a million different ways to construct objects in C++. I'm going to leave it at this for now. Choose your own adventure in your own code. So the only thing we need from here is the function execution operator to be implemented. And in our case, it's going to return a vector of integers. So that is the very healthy skeleton of the code. And what this will allow us to do is to create a permutation generator and then call it whatever we need to. So now let's zoom in on this function execution operator. Okay, so imagine we're inside the class, we're inside of permutation generator, and we're implementing the contents of the operator for function execution. Now, if you recall, we didn't actually fill in our vector. It's empty right now. So the first thing we should probably be doing here is when someone executes the function, we should fill that sucker with contents. Now this is debatable, right? Like some people would say, oh, you should do that in the constructor. I kind of agree, but what if you're instantiating millions of these, for instance, and you're not gonna execute all of them? Maybe you can't know which ones you're going to execute. In that case, it makes sense to delay filling the vector because you don't even know if you're going to need to use that memory. Also, this gives us an easy way to start the algorithm off. If we start by incrementing, then we're going to skip the first case entirely. So controversially, I'm going to fill the array inside the function execution operator. You can send hate mail to jg at jg.gg. So fill I'm assuming to be some sort of useful, fast way to fill the vector, which would probably look something like this. Now the next thing we want to do is find the place where the value decreases. And assuming we're not at the very end of the permutation, we will always find a value that decreases. In fact, if we don't find a value that decreases, we can be very sure that we have finished all of the possible permutations. The easiest way to find a decrease is to go to the very end, the very right side of the vector, and compare the last two. Now you can't have a decrease of just one number. You have to have to, it takes two numbers to have a decrease. So what we want to do here then is start with the next to last item and compare it to the last item. That will be our way of comparing the last two. So we're just going to use a loop here to walk from the right side to the left side, comparing the number we're at to the number that came to the right of us, and see if we're smaller than the number to the right of us. If we are, then we have found the special case. Now you'll notice we're avoiding the off by one here because we started at minus two. We started at the next to last, and so it's always safe to go one more than us because we skipped that one initially. But the next thing we have to be worried about is what if we run off the front of the list? In C++, if you run past the beginning of a vector, you are in an undefined state. It's no man's land there. Dragons, Bjarn Stroop Stroop with a ruler. You don't want to go there. But we do want to go all the way to the very beginning. Because if we're at the first number and we haven't decreased yet, then that means that the biggest number is in the first position and we're done. We can't possibly create another permutation. So we do need to say while decrease is greater than or equal to the very first position in the vector. So what we have to do in the loop is decrement our decrease iterator, but there's a special case here. And that special case is if we are right at the beginning of the vector, if we're there, we're done. We cannot possibly create another permutation. So one thing we could do here is we could throw, let's, but let's keep it real simple for the whiteboard and say, let's just return uh, an empty vector. So if we're here, we can assume that decrease is at the point in the vector where the number has gone down. So if we think back to our example case of three, five, four, two, one, we can be sure that decrease is at three. Now, if we remember back to the algorithm, what we need to find is the next bigger number in the tail, in the sort of end piece here. And in the example case we're talking about here, that's four, but we don't know what it's going to be in every single case. What we do know is it's going to be the first greater number in the tail piece from the decrease number that we've already found. So in this case, it's four, but it could just as easily have been that four was on the left side of the decrease point. And in that case, the next biggest number would be five. So let's find it. So we'll start at the very right edge of the vector and we'll come leftwards. If you remember, the numbers in the tail are going to be in descending sorted order. So if we come from the right side, as soon as we find a number that's bigger, that's our winner because any number that's to the left of that number is going to be bigger than that number, which would mean that we would skip numbers in generating the next increment. Once we finish this loop, we know that larger refers to the first bigger number in the tail than the decrease number. And if we think back to the algorithm as we discussed it earlier, 
the very next thing we need to do here is swap these two values. Now I'm going to omit the details of swap, but let's assume it looks something like this. We've almost finished the algorithm as we described it initially. Step one was to find the decrease in the vector. Step two was to find the next bigger value in the right side of the vector from that decrease. Step three was to swap them. Step four is now to reverse the remainder of the vector so that it will go from descending sorted order to ascending sorted order, putting the highest order numbers at the lowest order positions. So let's do that. I think we can easily do that with just two iterators and a loop. So just to check our indexes there, we've got base.n minus one, which in this case will point to one. Then we've got decrease, which was three, but is now four. And we're going to move one to the right of that, which should point us at five. And so the part we're going to be swapping is five, three, two, one, and four will be the beginning of the list. So now it's another simple loop to reverse the remainder of the list. So we start from the left and we start from the right. We swap the value at each position with the value at the other position. And then we move both pointers inwards towards each other. And I believe with this, we're done. We have modified our list in place and now we can just return it. So, so while generating all of the possible permutations of a list of numbers is actually an n factorial complexity problem. Here, our algorithm is only doing one iteration across the list for every call. So it's an O of n complexity solution to generating the next possible permutation. So I guess you could say this is an n factorial times n problem if you wanted to include the complexity of generating all of the permutations, which of course in, in big O would just be n factorial. Probably the most exciting thing about this though is that it's an in-place manipulation. So there's no additional memory. This is a, a bit higher complexity than some of the other problems you would face. And like I said before, I really think of this as kind of a, well, to put it in my terms, I would call this a dickhead coding interview question. Not because it's super high complexity, the complexity is tractable. Because there are too many little things that you have to notice in order to solve it efficiently. This falls into that category of question that you either get or you don't get, and it has nothing to do with your ability to code a solution to it effectively. And to me, that makes for a bad interview question. The best interview questions are ones where you have something to figure out. It's not so puzzly that if you don't happen to get the moment of insight, you're screwed for the rest of the interview. I'm including it in my video series because it's absolutely the kind of question that you would face off against at a very sort of algorithmic kind of company, the kind of company that really prides itself on its uh, computer science -y prowess. And that's all. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have comments, if you think my C++ sucks, if there's a million different ways to do it, please comment below. I would love to see a nerdy, smart comment fight on YouTube for once. So go for it.